are you uh, are you doing some sort of music as well well i've i've been a musician since i was 18 and a half i guess you know oh, i took wow. piano lessons as a kid but uh started my first band as a freshman in college and uh you know never really looked back uh after college i bought the equipment to start a recording studio so i was not only recording my own music but i was recording other bands and musicians and things and oh wow uh, i got to the point where uh you know well into the band years i wanted to start scoring film because you know i recorded a lot of music myself and mm -hmm. i noticed the stuff i was doing by myself was pretty soundtrack oriented even though that wasn't the attention um you could just kind of see that it would have been a natural uh progression so when i couldn't get any gigs scoring other people's projects i made a movie just so i could score it oh wow <laughs> that's interesting um so um have you always been fascinated by you know, um, movies and films and being interested to record, um, or is, was this something that, you know, you developed throughout the years, uh, while being a musician or, um, yeah. I think it was a little of both. Um, certainly being a musician and learning how to multi-track record. See, that was my favorite thing was laying down a track then laying down another track over it then trying to figure out you know how many tracks could i layer over top without it getting you know messy or or cluttered or what have you mm -hmm. so you know that that was exciting to me but then i can also trace it back to uh you know very early on before i was you know, before the first band was even really gigging, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of mine introduced me to Pink Floyd's Piper at the Gates of Dawn. And uh, that was just, that's a, the Pink Floyd's first album. And that was so unique that I really got the bug to learn how to record. Uh, and prior to that, I have a couple of experiences when I was a kid, my mom took me to go see uh, the original Halloween movie and John Carpenter's score was, it just, that changed everything. I remember that specifically knowing how I felt when I heard that music. So then every, mostly dramas and, and, thrillers and suspense and horror movies uh you know other movies have great score as well but i know how i felt when that creepy music came on in a scary movie like you knew something was going to happen you, it it made you feel a certain way and i always wanted to do that so it was kind of a perfect storm of i knew how to record i knew how to play instruments i knew what I liked from movie soundtracks and, you know, like I said, I made the first super low budget movie just so I could score it and then made the second one after that. So nobody would really remember the first one. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just kept getting a little bit better and a little bit better. And uh, here we are. Amazing. Yeah. And, um, you mentioned something that I'll be very interested to explore. You know, you, you mentioned that once you've heard the soundtrack, um, you know, you knew what you want to do and what sort of emotion you would like to, you know, to generate with your work as well. Um, what would you say is the effect that you want to like generate within the viewer? Um, I guess it's a very, you know, complex question to answer with words, but I would be interested to hear, you know, what fascinated you with, uh, especially with the horror genre and the soundtracks and the atmosphere that we get uh, in this sort of media. Uh, I feel like if you can immerse 
yourself as a viewer or as a filmmaker, you can immerse the viewer in this soundscape where it becomes another uh, character in the movie. Like the two things that I really like to do, and Ophelia isn't exactly uh, the perfect example of that because of how I chose to film it. Uh, but I still feel like you, you feel like you're in that house with the woman as she's going through what she goes through. But w a lot of my older films, I did a lot of handheld camera work to where as the, as the viewer, as the audience member, you feel like you're one of the group, one of the people in the movie and you're in the scenes watching people and what have you. And that's, that's one of the things that I think definitely uh, as a camera person and cinematographer is, is like my style is having the viewer feel like they're part of uh, the group of, of people in the movie. But then when you take the, the sound and you can take them on a, an additional journey, a simultaneous journey uh, with the sound effects, with the atmospherical noises, with the the music itself. I think that's that's a great experience and perfect examples are John Carpenter movies. But also, you know, you can look back at Jaws and, you know, the minute that dude who mm -hmm. as soon as you heard that, you knew it was bad news. And if you if you like watching classic uh, films, you can watch The Exorcist. No. And Tubular Bells is one of the main pieces of music in that. And that's very Carpenter-esque, although it came out before Carpenter's uh, big run in the movies. But that's the same way. It's this really melodic piece of music that when it's linked up to the imagery of the exorcist, you you feel it like it it became another character in the movie. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, you're bringing such a good point to everything, because especially when it comes to horror movies, I've always thought that um, the sound design of everything is such a crucial and significant part of the whole experience. And I sort of found out that the, the thing that scares me the most and that immerses me the most is exactly the sound. And, you know, and just um, in many movies, when you just hear the footsteps going on on a, some wooden board, you know, or the, just the, uh, the main antagonist uh, just doing noises around the house or whatever. And it, this is really the, the aspect that immerses you um, the most, really. You sort of may, you know, answer this question uh, in terms of um, Halloween being your, you know, the, the first movie that sort of ignited your passion towards this sort of art. Um, but what would you say are some, um, you know, other titles or directors or uh, whatever the case might be um, in terms of names that um, has sort of been crucial and significant in the process of your development? I like all genres. I mean, I, I started making horror movies just because you could do it on a low budget and still sell it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always a market for if it's a completed movie, it has a beginning, a middle and an end, and you can hear it. Mm -hmm. You have a couple of cool scares and gross, you know, special effects or whatever, you can sell it. You, you know, the number varies, the amount of dollars you can get for it varies, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't want to sit around and wait to hopefully do a movie. So I did, you know, the first one was like $2,000. Mm -hmm. You know, me and a friend had a couple cameras. We got a couple of Home Depot work lights put some gels over them and, you know, made a movie and just kind of learned. And the second one, a little more, you know, $10,000, which is still ridiculous, but, mm -hmm. you know, 
enough to buy food, pay the college kids, you know, a few hundred dollars to give us a couple weeks over the summer and, uh, you know, got a little bit better. And then, you know, it really started jumping up at that point, you know, nothing, nothing major budget wise, uh, 100,000, 200,000, 500,000. <clears throat> but um, it was it was the journey, it was the progress, it was learning, you know, what works and what doesn't work and and how to think quickly. Uh, because when you're working on a low budget, uh, you have to, you have to roll with the punches. Things, things go wrong all the time <laughs> and you can't just throw money at the problem. You have to be creative and you have to figure it out whether, you know, you're planning on shooting five pages at, you know, this one location and you get there and they're like, oh, sorry, our pipes burst, <laughs> you know, you got to figure something out because you got you know, 10, 20, 30 people standing around ready to shoot and you have to disappear for, you know, 30 minutes and rewrite five pages. And when you do that enough times, very little bothers you once, once the train starts rolling, you know? Um, so, I look at the the entire journey and the entire process as it was it was step by step by step. I got lucky enough to meet uh, a couple of really um, prominent screenwriters in the film business, and it started with during making the first movie. My mentor, uh, who I had you know, met on that first movie was a Michigan State University professor, uh, film professor and screenwriting professor. And he was Sam Raimi's professor when Sam was at Michigan State University. And Sam Raimi's a, a pretty well-known director mm -hmm. with, you know, many, many major <laughs> Hollywood movies. Especially well, a classic horror one too. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Ash versus Evil Dead and, you know, lots of TV shows, uh, him and his producing partner, Rob Tappert, Hercules and Xena and, mm -hmm. you know, lots of good, lots of good stuff. Well, his brother, Ivan, uh, who's a screenwriter and a, an emergency room doctor, um, I met through the MSU professor and we became friends and started writing uh, together and he taught me a lot. You know, my screenwriting professor friend laid the foundation. He taught me pacing and, you know, a lot of different things. And then working with Ivan and knowing, you know, he has several major movies uh, that got produced with his brother, watching his work ethic and him trusting me to say we would meet and he would, you know, we, I would have pages done. He'd be like, okay, this is great. This is great. Now let's take these two characters and combine them into one. Wow. And, and you're like, okay. So I would go home for a week and do that. And then we would meet and he's like, okay, that's good. That's good. Now, uh, you know, let's take these three scenes and turn it into one scene and get rid of this character altogether. Wow. So learning how to do that, you had to really separate things that you felt like you were married to in the script. Like you, you, you knew that it was the greatest mm -hmm. thing you ever wrote mm -hmm. and you have to learn to, to, you know, detach yourself to certain things, not all things. Cause if your gut tells you something's great, you know, fight for it. But mm -hmm. that gave me this whole new writing perspective and then I met a gentleman named Chuck Farr, who's a, a former Navy SEAL who wrote the movie Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen. Wow. And he wrote uh, Hard Target with Jean-Claude Van Damme. He wrote The Jackal with Bruce Willis and wow. Richard Gere, uh, Mission to Mars, uh, or excuse me, Red Planet and Virus. Um, we became partners 
And he he left Hollywood and moved to northern Michigan. And a friend of a friend introduced us. And we became good friends. And this is when Michigan had a film incentive, a pretty robust film incentive. Mm -hmm. And we spent several years putting together a all new scripts and packaged films with actors and, you know, getting financing together. And then sadly, the governor at that time got rid of the film incentive. So that all uh, fell apart. But my experiences with Chuck was yet another layer of tricks of the trade, different things. You know, there's a lot of great writers out there, but there's not a lot of writers who have written, you know, $100 million, $200 million box office movies. You know, I think one of Ivan's movies, uh, Spider-Man 2 or 3, mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking six, seven, eight hundred million dollars at mm -hmm. the box office. And, mm -hmm. you know, Chuck with the Jackal, uh, you know, that was that was a massive movie. Mm -hmm. So you take everything from these people, you try to keep true to yourself, but you learn from these people. And I'll tell you this, even though we're, we're not even really uh, talking about it, but one of my mm -hmm. Chuck was great with with one liners of wisdom. Mm -hmm where, you know, he would just say this, this one thing, but it could apply to everything in your writing situation. And I'll put this out there for any screenwriters who may watch this, you know, uh, if you're writing and you're, and you've, you've come to a little roadblock and you're not really sure, you know, how to get out of this corner you just painted yourself into, <laughs> his advice is, have two guys burst through the doors with shotguns shooting up the place. <laughs> and it, it it's not that specific. Like he does that because he's, he writes action movies, you know, but that can just mean disrupt the situation. Have, you know, you got two, two kids on the couch, you know, making out, you know, watching TV or whatever. And you're like, okay, well, where do I go from here? Well, have the, the parents of the girl burst through the door unexpectedly and send it into a whole new, you know, twist. And you can do it with just about anything, like just have two guys burst through the door with shotguns metaphorically, and you're in a whole nother, you know, whole nother direction ready to go. Uh, I can give you a, a million of those, but that's such a <laughs> such a good advice by the way it's so fascinating how as you said it something that is so simply put is actually so complex and and, and makes such a big sense actually